Welcome to the No Plateau Podcast. For stroke and brain injury survivors, their caregivers, and the therapists helping them to break boundaries in their recovery journey. Hosted by Henry Hoffman, a certified occupational and clinical therapist, and Pete Duran, a certified podcast host. CPH, look it up. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the No Plateau Podcast. I'm Pete Durand, along with Henry Hoffman, and uh, our producer, Kali Russo, is also on the call. Today, we're going to do a solo shot. Well, not really, more like a Han solo shot because it's just Henry and I. Okay. And we are going to let Henry run wild in Amazon and Google because we've had some stroke survivors and their caregivers reach out and say, I'm a little lost. I've, 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 I've kind of got out of the inpatient part of my rehab. I'm headed home, maybe doing some outpatient. I don't know what products to use. I don't know even where to start. And most people start in Google, and then they get an Amazon, and they said, how do I find the best product? So Henry, who does spend a lot of time doing this, is going to jump in and navigate and show us things to look for, things to be wary of, and then ultimately how to find the best products or services to meet your particular needs. Because we know every stroke survivor has a different story and a different path. So Henry, welcome. Hey, Pete. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Well, you know what they say about uh, when you've seen one stroke survivor? You've you seen one stroke survivor. survivor. That's right. Yeah, so it, gets, bump. it gets a little tricky. It gets a little tricky, but it's just, I'm, I'm so excited about this segment. And I could frankly do four of these and we'll see how the first one goes. And, and if folks want to want me to dive deeper, we can be happy to do that by clinical concern and, and go shopping together, so to speak, with a stroke survivor or brain injured individual. So all Perfect. right. Well, well, let's let's go through the steps. And, and this is over 25 years of working with neurological patients. And this is over thousands of patients we've seen, not only on my, my, my personal um, treatment, but also at Sabo. It is, it, it is a very frustrating experience. And, and pick the diagnosis, whether it's cancer, heart attack, hip replacement, stroke. No one is an expert typically with their ailment. Uh, so if you have a stroke, I doubt most of the patients we're neurologists or neurotherapists or neuro experts. So now they're thrusted into this environment where they have to become the expert. They have to be their number one ambassador and advocate. And so what happens is they suffer the stroke. And I'm talking to the family as well as the, as, as the patient. They suffer the stroke or they have their brain injury. They're sent to the hospital to survive. And after they're stabilized, they then um, enter into the acute and subacute stages. And for the most part, acute would be your first seven days and subacute would be typically based on who you, who you read. Um, it could be after seven days for three months, some, some take it to six months, and then you eventually get to your chronic phase. So what happens is while the uh, loved one is in the hospital getting stable, uh, the family is very scared, very nervous, or they're starting their therapy. They start to go online to figure out, okay, what is stroke? How did it happen? What are my chances for progress? And uh, what do I need to do to get my leg, arm, speech, uh, maybe cognitive um, skills back? So as they continue to progress through their rehab journey, sadly, not all of those journeys are positive. Whether they had a clinician who was in the greatest, up to date on the latest research, a uh, doctor who, um, I've heard this many times, where the patient was written off and, and pulled a plug, um, all the way to, wow, what a great spontaneous recovery after seven or, or 21 days. And that does happen. You get patients that have spontaneous recovery. But for the most part, most patients are going to be sent home with uh, some ability to walk, and they'll have um, typically moderate hemiparesis. And hemiparesis is when you're, it's not... Uh, paralysis. Paralysis means you have no movement. Paresis is just weakness. And for right. the most part, people will have uh, weakness and spasticity. And there's something called the Brunstrom stages of recovery, which I highly recommend our uh, audience uh, Googles. Um, Signe Brunstrom was a wonderful physio uh, who created these predictable recovery stages. And it starts with the flaccid stage, and that's early on in the, in the healing process. And then most clients uh, quickly transition 
uh, to a spasticity phase where they start to get some uh, movement, but there's, it's spastic. And then their goal is to break out of that spasticity stage where they can actually fire muscles without the spasticity holding them back like one big uh, ball of synergy. And as they can initiate some of those movements outside of synergy, they progress through the stages to the point where they actually have some isolated independent movement free from spasticity. So you're going to get a majority of the patients probably stuck in the middle of the stages. And uh, they get sent home. And uh, and this is what this podcast is for. This is, you know, yeah, we'll talk about if you're the 10% fringe, you're doing amazing. Or the 10%, geez, I'm still 100% flaccid. There's things you can do. It's, you don't give up if you're, if you're early Brunstrom stages and you have some flaccidity. And frankly, well, you know, this could be a separate talk. You actually want to have spasticity because it goes through the progression of if you're completely flaccid, you want to actually get the spasticity and eventually break out of break out of those spastic synergies. So they get home, and I've heard this a million times. They didn't feel like they received enough solutions uh, with their healthcare professional. So now they're guessing. So they go online and they search common things like stroke exercise equipment, strengthening my stroke hand stretches, help my stroke shoulder pain. Usually they'll have the keyword stroke in it or neurology or brain injury. So I was saying to Pete, gee, wouldn't it be great if we just do a podcast on me Googling on, and by the way, Amazon being the number one platform for shopping, let's just start there. We'll do other, if you guys want it, we'll do other segments where we can uh, dive deeper in different platforms. And Amazon is not the only place, obviously. Um, there's a lot of great stroke exercise equipment that's not even on Amazon. But I figured that is the normal path for most patients. They go to Amazon or they Google, and of course, they're going to see Amazon on the first page, and they click on it, you can get completely lost at that point. So I figured let's, let's do a you know, quick episode on going to Amazon and let's go shopping if we were a stroke patient. And I can at least, from my experience, uh, it's just one opinion, explain what the research wants you to do, and then let's compare that to what's actually available for you on Amazon. And then let's actually look at how it's advertised because part of the problem is these um, manufacturer sponsored um, products are falsely advertised where they lump in all these diagnoses going to cure stroke, peripheral neuropathy, MS. I mean, you name it, it, this product will do it. And that's not the case. So let me just kind of do what I do with my, this is what I do with all my patients. We go on Amazon and we talk about it. So without further ado, Pete, do you want me to go on Amazon? And Jump in. All right. Yeah. Let's go to, let's go, let's go play around. All right, so what we know for sure is uh, you can't get everything on Amazon that evidence uh, has shown to be effective for stroke recovery. Things you can get, and we, we'll have podcasts on all of these treatments in the future, you can get electrical stimulation products, and that's shown to be effective. There's beneficial, there's kind of beneficial, and there's not beneficial. And so these, these products that you can get are in the beneficial or kind of beneficial camp. In my opinion, you should try them. So you can get e-stim, you can get uh, orthotics, you can get strengthening tools, you can get mirror box therapy, um, and you can get vibration uh, devices to help uh, with stimulating your muscles, reducing spasticity. So there are a few things you can get. So what I'm going to do, and you tell me if uh, you can see the screen okay, I'm going to yep. type in what my patients type in, and we'll start with the obvious. Stroke, we'll do rehab equipment or exercise equipment. What do you think? Rehab. Okay. Stroke rehab equipment. Let's see what happens. All right. So the first thing that pops up is a leg bike. And I'm a big fan of uh, leg bikes. I definitely think it's worth getting it as well as an arm bike because A, when we have a stroke, we're more sedentary. We don't, we don't mm -hmm. get up enough and we don't do the things we need to be doing to stay active for cardiovascular reasons. And we know sitting down can actually cause many uh, disabilities and diseases, uh, especially for folks that are at their desk all day. So a big fan mm -hmm. of the first thing I'm seeing. So, so far I'm pleasantly surprised. All right, let me, I don't want to become a prime member right now. Now, as I scroll down, I put in, remember I put in stroke rehab equipment. So as I scroll down, I see an arm bike, which is good. I see this contraption here, which, you know, I'm seeing a ton of these lately. They're out of Asia. These are these robotic uh, gloves. So I had to do some research. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about this one. Um, I probably, and, and I'm, I'm taking it from a financial perspective. Uh, the median household income in America is roughly 60 to 70,000 per year. And if you've suffered a neurological injury, you may have lost one of the incomes. So you're probably looking at 40, 30, 
25,000 per year. So you don't have a lot of extra cash to buy stuff. So from my perspective, if I have limited funds, I want to make sure what I'm buying is really the strongest evidence to support this. And, you know, I'll give you some homework at the end, guys, to consider as you make your research. Um, but, but just keep that in mind as we go through this. So with this particular product, what I've learned about it, and, and you're going to see a lot of them that look like them, other copycat products out of uh, China, is it's a continuous passive motion robotic device, which opens and closes your hand. So if you want to just sit home and have a robot do this all day, well, I guess technically that's not a bad thing. It's going to kind of keep your joints and um, tendons moving, which means it'll prevent contracture. But it's not going to rewire your brain to the level you want it to, if, if that's what people are trying to do. If you're trying to improve hand function, there's no evidence to suggest that this is your top 20, top 10 items to purchase. It'll certainly prevent soft tissue contractures, maybe. It may minimize soft tissue contractures and pain, decrease in swelling. But if you're trying to get hand function, this is not my top five or 10. There is a trigger feature where if I, if I initiate movement with my unaffected hand, it'll open. And if I initiate movement and squeeze with my unaffected hand, it will close. But again, that's just triggered movement. Uh, what we want to ultimately be doing is um, high repetitious functional task training where you actually do meaningful tasks, incorporating your hand to pick objects up, challenging your grasping, and then dropping them into other areas. Uh, just challenging doing purposeful movements. Uh, this is not one of those devices. This is more of just a continuous passive motion device. Um, but I could see why patients would get pretty excited about it. If you see a video and you see your hand opening and closing a couple times, wow, I got to get that. But then that problem is you strongly then assume this is going to get my hand back. And that's where you got to be very careful. So would I buy it? Um, maybe. Would it be my top five or 10 items first? Absolutely not. There's other things I would definitely purchase before that. So I wouldn't say don't buy it. I just wouldn't put it at the top or the middle of the list. All right. So as I continue to scroll down, um, I see what else? Again, here we go again with some of these robotic hand devices. This just came out probably in the last few months. This one's a leg lift. I, I, I put it in stroke rehab equipment, so I'm getting leg too. Um, some people use those for uh, ADLs to lift your foot around the bed. So I'll avoid talking about the ADL section today, Pete, and just focus and on AD, ADL, Henry, so people understand what that means. Yeah, ADL means activities of daily living. So we'll do a separate yep. podcast on ADLs, and let's just focus on motor recovery uh, for today. Mm -hmm. So my patients have all these things. They have pulleys. Now, I'm going to caution you about pulleys. If you have an impaired uh, spastic upper arm, which is going to be pretty tight, maybe some stiffness, um, your, your shoulder blade is not going to be working perfectly with your arm bone, your humerus, as you go to raise your arm. And you're going to have some capsular tightness, which means your joint's stiff. The last thing I want to be doing is recommending a pulley, because as you raise that affected arm up, you're cranking at the top of your shoulder bone, which is called your acromion, and that's called impingement. You're going to ultimately you're going to cause a rotator cuff tear or definitely some bursitis and possibly tendonitis. So I'm not a big fan of recommending um, pulleys, and that is something that a ton of these uh, patients are getting. Um, there's other ways to stretch your shoulder safely, and of course, feel free to message me after, and I can give you some advice on that. There are putty or exercise balls. These are great. There's, you're going to see a loads of these. You, of course, you want to increase your grip strength. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you said increase your grip strength, therapists would look at you like you're deer in headlights. Because back in the day, Pete, we were taught never strengthen a spastic muscle. That will increase spasticity. The problem there is there was no evidence to support that theory, but yet they had no problem saying that. So we were taught that in school. We were taught that by our supervisor. Well, thank, thank, thankfully, lo and behold, there's hundreds of articles that talk about strength training with spastic hemiparesis, and there's no detrimental effect. In fact, it shows great outcomes. So, so strength, strengthen away, uh, my friends, and, and find strengthening tools. So as I scroll down, and I'm going to type in a couple other searches besides this generic one, um, not a big fan of arm slings. Some people think that if you have subluxation where you have that gap in your shoulder, and by the way, we have a lot of uh, uh, old, older videos and, and, and newer videos and some blogs on subluxation, so feel free to search for those. But when you have your arm bone, you have your top of your acromion, your arm comes down, you have this space. And folks know what I'm talking about. It's called subluxation. So the problem with subluxation is people think that they need to support it up. 
because you don't want it to hang down. And that makes sense. It's a logical thing to think about. So they try things like taping. Um, and there's different types of tapes out there. But imagine putting a piece of tape on the most superficial part of your limb, which is your skin, which is already pliable. Radiograph show, studies show that when you tape a arm bone and try to approximate it back into the joint, what do you think happens? It's going to magically, not magically, but you would think it's just going to drop right back down. And there's going to be that mm -hmm. space there. So taping is not effective. Research shows slings are not effective for approximating or reducing the subluxation. Now, however, one caveat to that, slings have been shown to help with decreasing pain. So there's a lot of slings out there. This is not my favorite because it has your uh, arm going across your chest, which is encouraging more internal rotation, which will encourage more stiffness. There are other slings out there, and feel free to reach out to me if you would like my recommendation. And sorry if I'm going too fast here, but there's so many pages. Um, splints. Orthotics are definitely um, something to consider. The research is mixed, but the reason why I like splints are it prevents more contractures from occurring. I don't think anyone's signing up for having their fingernails to dig into their palm after one year of severe spastic, uh, spasticity. So if you can keep your hand open through stretching and a splint program, that's going to prevent further contractures. Now, one caveat to that is what type of splint? I, I recommend you stay far away from those static splints. Those static splints will cause your finger, uh, when your tone kicks in, you uh, sneeze, you cough, you laugh, your fingers want to curl and tighten up. It's called associated reaction. So with static splints, your fingers start to pull out. So for anyone who's watching the video podcast of this, you can see my fingers trying to pull out, and that causes mm -hmm. joint damage and hypermobility. So when you do pick a splint, pick one that has a very flexible, preferably spring-loaded hand plate, um, and that will allow, we, we have the Sabo stretch, uh, Pete, and that obviously allows them to protect your joints. Sure. So that's something definitely to recommend. Um, however, I wouldn't recommend this guy right here. This is a high profile uh, splint that looks pretty, pretty interesting. Now, I would never have a stroke patient wear this, okay? And look at the advertisement. The advertisement says, the description says, finger revoltation brace, hand training finger orthotics, for stroke hemiplegia patients, tendons exercise. Okay. Give me a break. Any therapist who reads that, what you clearly can see is this manufacturer is trying to lump one product into so many diagnoses just to maximize their shopping audience. And what you can tell just by the picture alone is that's what a stroke survivor's hand is going to look like. Right. So if you put that on, that's what your hand's going to look like, folks. Yet for some reason, this manufacturer who's, I would have to say, clueless when it comes to treating stroke recovery um, feels that this is perfect for stroke hemiplegia patients. Now, who could use that product in theory are people who've had your big knuckle, they're called your MCP, uh, replaced. It's called an arthroplasty. All mm -hmm. orthopedic conditions or someone who had a radial nerve palsy or someone who had a tendon repair. But would you really want that outrigger as high as a Statue of Liberty? I mean, that's pretty, pretty impressive. So, so, and these are the conversations I have with my patients all the time. And I'm only doing this... Uh, to, to be honest, genuine, and sincere, because I know you guys out there, you have no idea. You weren't, you weren't trained to be a therapist. You weren't trained to be a stroke expert. You just see, wow, look, Gina, it says stroke hemiplegia for patients, and let's order it. And guess where that $67 product will be after seven hours? Hopefully it's returned, right. but some of you guys have it in your closet, and that's the disappointing part. All right, the next one, Mirbox. Huge fan of Mirbox. This one says Mirror Therapy Box for stroke, phantom limb pain. This one's properly described. Um, there's a lot of mirror boxes out there and just find one that you, you find is most appropriate. But a big fan for mirror box, as a reminder guys, and we'll go into these in future podcasts, mirror box is when you put your um, affected hand and it's occluded in a box in this example, or it's just occluded visually, you can't see it. And you have your unaffected hand in front of the mirror. And as you look in the mirror, you see the reflection of your unaffected hand, which is, looks like it's your affected hand, believe it or not. We have a lot of resources and videos on Mirrorbox. And by imagining that your um, affected hand is moving and looks normal again, can actually rewire your brain through a, a, um, mirror neurons, if you will, as well as rewiring uh, from a neuro, uh, neuroplasticity. Those mirror neurons are empathetic and they feel that, gee, my hand is working. I'm watching my hand work. It must be working. And suddenly you can see cortical changes and improvement 
uh, with spasticity and strength and some other uh, 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 physical um, improvements. This was originally done for soldiers coming back that were amputated and they had phantom limb pain. That's why it says here for phantom limb pain. When the patient's limb was amputated, they could still feel like their foot was there and it hurt, but there was no foot. And what they decided to do, Dr. Ramachandran did this, a wonderful uh, neuroscientist, what they decided to do was put the stump, visually occlude it from um, the soldier seeing the stump and put their good leg in front of a mirror and guess what? The pain went away. It's, it's a fascinating discovery and they applied it now to other neurological conditions such mm -hmm. as brain injury. All right. So as we scroll down, we see another one of our friendly robotic devices um, that you already heard my spiel on that. I'll avoid the ADL act, the self-care strap there for another talk. That's just to lift the leg up. We saw a splint. Here's some more hand grippers, hand strengthening tools. Big fan of this one as well. All of them. It doesn't matter if it's therapeutic or not. You just want to be working on um, grip strength. Just because you have spasticity does not mean you have strength. I mean, think of, and here's another way to look at it. If Arnold Schwarzenegger had a stroke today, and, and now three hours later, he cannot lift his arm. Do you think Arnold Schwarzenegger's muscles are weak? No. I mean, the guy was just lifting weights last yesterday, right? He was keeping up with you, Pete. And then suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, he lost the connection from the brain because the cortical cells were dead to the limb. So his muscle strength is amazing. He just lost the connection. So suddenly people think with hemiparesis, well, that means Arnold Schwarzenegger is weak after day one post-stroke. And it's kind of weird to think about that way. It's just losing those connections from the brain to the spinal cord down to the affected limb. All right, let's just scroll a little bit longer and then we'll type in something else. And by the way, I could scroll all the way down here. Another leg bike. Okay, here's a vibrator. Vibration has been shown also to be beneficial. And when I, when I talk about what's beneficial and what's not beneficial, I'm, I'm referring to important uh, resources, and one of them which is the um, uh, Dr. Teasel's uh, uh, slash Canadian par Partnership uh, Evidence-Based uh, uh, Stroke Recovery, uh, the research they did, the summary review, ebrsr.com. There you can find out exactly all the things that are considered um, beneficial, things that are considered somewhat beneficial or mixed, and things that are considered not beneficial. And vibration is considered beneficial. So when you look at this... Uh, tool here, what you do is you put the vibration, there's a lot of these devices out there, over the muscle that you're trying to fire. So for instance, a lot of us, if you suffered a stroke, a lot of you have a hard time opening your hand or extending your fingers. Uh, uh, one strategy would be to put the vibration over the muscles. For that example, it would be just below your elbow. I'm showing everyone on the screen, just below your elbow on your extensors. And that could help with firing your finger extensors by causing um, the muscles to contract. You could do the opposite. If, you're, if your flexors are very spastic, you could put the vibration on the spastic muscles. And what those can do is we can cause those repeated contractions to cause fatigue or relaxation of the spastic muscles. So I would recommend uh, uh, getting a vibration device. But with any of these devices, it's just going to show up. It's in a box. A therapist doesn't come in that box. So you're going to have to make the decision, well, how am I going to learn how to use this correctly? So that's why it's important. I know we do it. Maybe some of the other companies do it. You got to go and, and go to YouTube and you got to Google vibration and stroke therapy and watch these other clinicians, for example, um, applying it to patients. Mirrorbox, uh, Google and YouTube, Mirrorbox therapy and watch these videos. You just can't buy the product without understanding how to use it. Okay. Um, as we scroll down, we see some more arm bikes. Uh, now I see our first electrical stimulation device. Um, I would definitely recommend eStim. There's a lot. Well, I'll hold off on the eStim until I Google that in a second. But eStim is one of them I would recommend. As I continue to go down, I do see, what is this? Leg activator, the seated leg exerciser machine for seniors. And Okay, so I'm not really probably going to be buying this one anytime soon. Um, uh, you know, if it, it's more, it looks like it's one of those vibration plates that you can put your feet on and increase in circulation. I think if I only had a foot problem and I'm not worried about my hand and I have limited funds, I would, I would hold off on this product. Um, vibration, like I said, is effective. You could probably get that to reduce some of the spasticity, but I wouldn't reduce spasticity, um, at the foot level. I would probably want to reduce it at the calf level because remember when you have foot drop, it's because you're plantar flexors 
or your gastroc muscles or your calf muscles are very spastic. So I'm going to be doing a lot of vibration there versus right at my finer muscles in my feet. So I'm going to probably hold off on this one and do more research. So then I see this one to the right, uh, wrist strengthener, hand developer. Oh, it's a hand developer. Wow. Um, arm, hand, grip, workout, strengthener. No, now it's under stroke and it's on the first page. Let me click on this one. I could see a bunch of my patients wanting to buy this and I want to see if they're making a mistake. So let's see what it says here. Um, as I scroll down, good for beginners. Okay. Adjustable tension, more benefits. So I don't see anything about stroke. So that's good. So we're not trying to, I'm not saying it can't be used for stroke, but for a lot of the patients I have, um, they typically are already have their wrist in a flex position. And if I'm trying to do some strengthening tools, I could see why that could be a good one to strengthen your wrist. Um, but I really want to focus on getting my fingers to engage into functional tasks. So, so I'm going to probably look for products that can work on keeping my hands open so I can pick objects up first. I'm also probably going to work on look for products that are going to allow my fingers to extend. And I already purchased a product that's going to help my squeezing and my gripping. So this one, I don't think I'd put it the top five or 10 because I already got grip strength or uh, yeah, grip strength checked off by buying a grip gripping device. So I don't know if I'm ready to buy this one for wrist flexion because I'm also need to buy some other things and, and we'll, and we'll dive into that. So let me go back. So as I scroll down, okay, I see something that opens my hand. So with clients that are trying to keep their fingers open, you're going to need some type of device that's going to keep the fingers open that will allow you to grasp and release. Uh, so I don't know too much about this particular product. Um, I wonder how much support there really is. It does say stroke recovery. It does say it is uh, for exercise, um, and it's and it's pretty darn cheap. So I, I would want to understand this one a little bit more. I get a little nervous because if I have, when you have very, very, very mild spasticity or almost no spasticity, then this, this might be worth considering. But if you have any spasticity whatsoever, I probably would not be uh, picking this product up just because these little straps here are just not going to keep your fingers open. You need something that's going to also support your wrist. And what I can tell from this position is your wrist is going to go right into flexion and your fingers are going to stay curled. So the, someone that's perfect for this type of product are maybe re real neuro palsy patients, orthopedic patients, or no spasticity, almost flaccid. So that's one product to think about. Hand grippers, these are, these are good because you can grip, if you go to the gym and you want to be able to grip that uh, bar, um, you can look at hand grippers. And then down here, finger extensors. Okay. So patients need to remember, if you have no active finger extension, then don't buy a finger extensor strengthening product because you can't use it. You don't have the ability to extend your fingers yet, right? This is going to be perfect for that last stage of the Brunstrom I was telling you about. Once you start getting your movement back and you can start opening your hand, you can then start applying resistance. And that would be a good product to get if you want to apply some resistance. And then just a couple more scrolls, and then we'll go to a different uh, search page. Okay, this one. This one's interesting. Rechargeable infrared electrical fingerboard anti-spasticity exer exercise ball compressed stroke. Com okay, holy. God. Let's let's start over. Rechargeable infrared electric fingerboard anti-spasticity exercise ball compressed stroke hemiplegia fingers recovery massage therapy rehabilitation, spasm dystonia. I mean, so, okay, Pete, new rule to all my patients. If you read a product description that looks like they're trying to throw the kitchen sink at you, just move on. Just like the last one I showed you, this is very suspicious. Okay. Especially since they use the word hemophilia, hem hemiplegia twice in the same description. Yeah. And by the way, they call it the anti-spasticity. I'd like to see the research on that. So, yeah. so does, there may be vibration here. Let's look into it. Because remember, I said I'm a fan of vibration. It says massage. So it says high frequency vibration. But here's my biggest problem. I want to do vibration up in the forearm where the finger flexors are and the finger extensors. Do I want to spend all my time vibrating the thener and hypothenor muscles, those small intrinsic muscles? I don't think I'm going to get the best bang for the buck. So I would say go get that other vibration device that can be 
because that can be applied in any muscle group. Um, leg, arm, you don't have to attach it. This one looks like it's just for the hand. But yeah, major red flag, folks. When you see sentences like that, walk away. All right, and then finally, anything else? All right, let's go back to the top. Oh, look at these. Customers who viewed these items apparently are buying. Pete, what the heck is that? You have to tell me what that is. Oh, the easy mount? Yeah. Twister arm exerciser? I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, because there's zero of my patients look like that, number one. And zero, of my, and, and zero of my patients, I think, can actually use that. So we'll hold off on that one. Um, yeah. Now, let's go to the top. We said stroke rehab equipment. Now let's go a little bit deeper, put in stroke hand uh, exercise. I think clients would say something like this. Okay. So good news. We got the grip strengthening we talked about before. Uh, we have the arm bike we talked about. Good. Ooh, here we go again with that high profile outrigger. So uh, I would not be recommending this one. This is the one that kind of shoved everything into the description. I wonder if it's the same company. Splints, we talked about splints are good. Uh, they help prevent contractures, minimize contractures, if you will. Trying to avoid the fingernails digging into the palm over, over time. My only recommendation is to get a dynamic uh, spring-loaded hand plate instead of the static ones. And I see different hand grippers. Again, there's that anti-spasticity one I wouldn't recommend. Okay, so these are all ones here. So let's go back to the top. I think we got that one under control. Let's put in shoulders. And do you want me to keep the word, I think keep the word stroke since po since folks would probably do that? Stroke yeah, I, I would keep it in there, yep. And then do we want to do exercise or just stroke shoulder? I'd say exercise, right? All right or rehab, try. something, yeah. Or products. Let's try exercise first. Mm -hmm. All right, we talked about the problems with pulleys. Not a huge fan if you, unless you're real high level, but then again, why are you using a pulley, right? So I just don't like the way the arm um, is loaded into the joint. Uh, as it tries to go up and you can cause some impingement. All right, I like this one. This is a nice uh, shoulder stretching tool. This one's gonna help you with external rotation. So let's see what the, yeah, there's the video and it kind of shows you, you can watch the video. You put your hand on the handle there. And then as you can see in this photo, can you see that photo? The, mm -hmm. you, there's a bunch of exercises you're gonna work on properly stretching your shoulder in different positions that are safe. So the range master shoulder one, I'm sure there's others, uh, would definitely be one I'd be recommending for my, my patients um, to work on your shoulder stretching. Okay, there's all your pulleys. We're bypassing. Now remember, I put in shoulder, so we're going to see a lot of pulleys. Um, and pulleys are good for non-stroke. You know, I, a lot of my geriatric patients who had rotator cuff repairs, orthopedic injuries, I do pulleys all day long. I just get really worried from a, from a uh, neurological point of view, some mm -hmm. of the orthopedic issues. Um, TheraBand, TheraBand can be used as a way to strengthen your shoulder. You tie, if you don't, if you can't hold on to the TheraBand, what you do is you tie a knot around it and you, and you create an opening to put your wrist through. So you have to grip and then you tie the other end of the TheraBand to the doorknob, for instance, and then you can do your different exercises. Now, how do you know which one to do? Well, you're going to, you're going to get it. And then you're going to go to YouTube or and you're going to Google TheraBand shoulder exercises. And I would probably even say put in stroke, but you don't have to. And then you're going to learn all the different exercises you can use with TheraBand. All right. I see this interesting one. It's a sponsored ad. It's called heated shoulder brace, uh, portable electric wireless heating, infrared pad strap, hot and cold therapy for rotator cuff. Um, let me click on this one. Is there anything describing stroke? So muscle pain, rotator cuff. So if you're having shoulder pain, the research uh, discusses using TENS, which is a form of electrical stimulation. And we're going to do e-stim next. So I won't dive into it too much right now. That does help for some. It's, it's, it's somewhat beneficial where you can reduce pain by blocking the pain messages to the brain. So you take these electrodes, you put them on the area where the area that's uh, affected as far as pain, and you, 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 you put on the appropriate TENS program, and that can help with some of your pain issues. Of course, I would recommend that that is supervised by a health professional. Um, this one kind of throws in all these other bells and whistles and has this big garment. Personally, I wouldn't be recommending that. All you need is the TENS unit. It does thermo modalities help, hot and cold help, Sure, some people respond as a temporary 
relief. So we've all done a hot pack before. We've all done a cold ice pack before. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with uh, taking your e-stim device, putting an electrode there, and putting an ice pack on top of it. So you can consider that. Um, I'm just not a huge fan of these three-in-ones. I just think the quality might not be the great. E-stim products alone are going to cost you $100, a good one, minimum. So if you can get all that for 64, that kind of scares me, right? So let's go back a little. Keep going. Uh, we talked about shoulder braces. I have a lot of these patients coming in with shoulder slings braces. Your folks, you're, you don't need to do this. If you have a subluxation, you're going to address your subluxation. I, I strongly encourage you to watch um, a uh, clinical convos. It's a video I did with Dr. Wolf on subluxation. You're going to. It tells you where to put the electrodes, why you put them there, which ones not to use, which ones to use, what type of program. You're going to put those electrodes on those weakened shoulder muscles, and that's going to allow the shoulder to migrate up back into the joint over time. The best way to reduce your subluxation is by active shoulder strengthening. If we can strengthen your deltoid, we can reduce your shoulder subluxation. What's not going to reduce your shoulder subluxation are shoulder straps and slings or tape. Right. These will help with pain, but not with reducing subluxation. Okay, let's do one more page here. This is a trigger point. Massage, uh, I, I use these all the time for my trigger points. So if you happen to have a spasm in your neck, by all means, that would be a good one to get. Arm bikes. Uh, what is this? Strength training massage machine. No, I wouldn't be wasting your money on that. Uh, remember, you're trying to improve typically shoulder, elbow, hand. Maybe you have some pain in the neck. Okay. That's a different podcast and we can talk about that. But I'm going over just some general uh, uh, um, joints that you should you try to improve through neuroplasticity. And that's what we're looking at here. All right. So as you scroll down, it's the same stuff, just a different manufacturer. All right. So let's go back up to the top. Let's put in uh, show, stroke electrical stimulation. Now you don't have to put in the word stroke, but I'm curious to see the ones that are advertised at for stroke. Now you're not going to be surprised if you see thousands. Actually, let me take stroke out here. Let's put in Electro, oops, let's put in electrical stimulation by itself. Because right, now we're going to see thousands. Here they all are. Okay. Welcome to the world of Eastim. Now, Eastim, let me see how many pages there are. I mean, I can go on and on. This could be like a seven day podcast. So let's go to page three. Still Eastim. Okay. So let me go back to page one. Now, Eastim is going to be used for a lot of different conditions. It's going to be used orthopedically. Go back to page one. Sorry for the quick scroll. It's going to be used for pain. It's going to be used to help strengthen muscles. People use it for incontinence. That's what that is. It's used for incontinence. Okay. I've seen all of my patients show up with these where there's like 79 electrodes and 114 <laughs> programs. Okay. All you need is a two-channel stim device. You could even do a one-channel. That means you have, let's do one channel, one lead wire that comes out of that one port that gives you two wires connected to it for two electrodes. So if you have a two channel, that means two lead wires coming out of two uh, individual ports, two ports. So it's a channel one, channel two. And then that has a total of four electrodes, two for each lead wire. And you can then put, for instance, two electrodes on your forearm for finger extension. And you can put two electrodes on your lower leg if you have foot drop. So you can do both at the same time. And there's specific programs that you're going to want to use to fire those muscles. So that's where you need to talk to a therapist. Let the therapist help you. You may find a video um, which gives you the protocol. Um, our programs, and maybe there's others that actually highlight those in a manual. So maybe if you get a really, put it this way, if you get a Eastim device and it's under $75, chances are the manual is not good. And chances are it's not going to give you what you want. And by the way, it's probably a TENS device. And TENS is, see how it says here, T-E-N-S? That's transcranial, uh, transcra uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Sorry about that. And that is used to block pain. That is not going to be used to contract a muscle and strengthen a muscle. EMS, it's, it's like alphabet soup, Pete. You have EMS, which is electrical muscle stimulation. Mm -hmm. also known as NMES, which is neuromuscular electrical stimulation. And what that is, is you set a timer on your device and the e turns on for 10 seconds, turns off for 10 seconds. 
Turns on for 10 seconds. Turns off for 10 seconds. You pick a program. You pick an on time. You pick an off time. So let's say 10 seconds. And then you pick this ramp up time where it ramps up for the ESTEM and it ramps off. And then you pick all of your different uh, parameters, your frequency, your pulse width. So there's a lot of stuff. And not everyone knows how to use it. So NMES or EMS is the type of device you're really looking for. Now, if you happen to see the word FES, that stands for functional electrical simulation. And that's typically done not so much you're sitting watching uh, Geraldo, remember Geraldo? And it's 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off, and you're ignoring your arm, and you're letting ESTEM do everything for you. FES is functional electrical simulation. What that is, is when you're actually going to do a timed task while the ESTEM's on, pick up an object, ESTEM opens up, uh, then you go to grab the object, the ESTEM helps close your fingers, and then you let go of it, and your ESTEM opens up your hand again. And a lot of those are used with a trigger button. And it's very hard to find devices with a trigger button, so you can time the ESTEM with a functional task. Uh, we do have a trigger button at Sabo, um, just because it's hard to find them. So as you look through all of these, uh, lots of products ranging from $350 down to $36, okay? But like I said earlier, if it's under 75, chances are it's a TENS device. If you're trying to get your hand to open or your shoulder to go back in its joint or an arm to move, you're not gonna do it with a TENS device. So read the fine print. You're looking for an EMS or an NMES, uh, EMS meaning electrical muscle stimulation device, okay? So that is uh, electrical stimulation. And one last one I think we should do, and then Pete, I want you to jump in and tell me what I'm missing here. Uh, let's sure. put stroke, uh, you want to put in foot drop? Yeah, just do foot drop, and that'll be our last one. All right. So when I put in foot drop, and by the way, folks, uh, we'll do other ones where we can dive deeper and per, it won't be Amazon, it'll just be in general, because we know part of the hurdle is, yeah, anyone can go to Amazon and buy anything right now. But getting educated first on what the research uh, wants you to do and how to find that research and how to understand and, and, and comprehend what the results are from those studies. And that could be another podcast. So, okay. So we have a lot of foot drop devices here. They're out of shoe foot drops and then there are in shoe foot drops. And, you know, some people need in shoe foot drops. So if, if I put in foot drop, you may have heard of the term AFO. Okay, see how AFO came with up? AFO means ankle foot orthosis. So let me just do AFO foot drop. These are going to be ankle foot orthosis. So this is an in-shoe device. This is an in-shoe device, okay? All these are in-shoe right here, right? Now, if you talk to 90%, maybe 95% of stroke survivors, they hate their in-shoe AFOs. Number one, it's Agreed. uncomfortable. Number one, it's uncomfortable. Number two, you are compensating, meaning you can no longer fire those foot muscles the way you want to. So that is an actual form of compensation, which is going to minimize your neuroplasticity uh, opportunity. And number three, you have to buy two sizes of shoes. So you're buying an extra pair of shoes because you'll have your size 10 on your, your unaffected side and you'll need a size 11 on your affected side. So, but here's the problem. Some people absolutely need an AFO because they have so much flaccidity. They're very unstable. They're very weak and their ankle will roll or they have so much spasticity. They would never work with a soft strap or an out of shoe brace. So foot, obviously with all of my advice today, guys, get it approved by your health professional before you purchase anything. Um, Cause I don't know your condition specifically, but uh, it, on, on the extreme ends of flaccidity and spasticity, some of you are going to need an inside shoe AFO. Now, if I go to just put in foot drop, you're going to see a bunch of uh, out of shoe foot drop devices. Uh, you can see one here where it buckles through the, the shoelace. You see this one pops through as well. Uh, these are going to be for the folks that have very mild spasticity or they're really not that flaccid. Okay. So there's a ton to choose from. Um, you just want to make sure it's, you can put it on one-handed. The key is, does it clear your foot as you walk? And can you get the device on one-handed? And then I think those are the two uh, key components for you. Uh, Pete, we went with the dial um, that you probably see on ski boots and helmets mm -hmm. and a dial that tightens up. 
uh, gosh, uh, that was the way to go because and we're going to do dials for other other devices than orthotics because the dining process is so simple. So that's mm-hmm. something for the folks to think about. Hey, look at here. Under foot drop, I have this awesome calf stretcher. I would highly recommend that. So, And there's others out there. If you have foot drop, chances are you have some tightness in your calf muscle, and you're going to want to stretch that. So that's a cool one to use because you can grab that on with one hand and pull back. So that that's pretty neat to see. Um, that's a nighttime stretching device that might be helpful. You'll see it says here for plantar fasciitis, but sometimes it can help for stroke patients as well. So there's a lot of different types of AFOs. So we talked today uh, for today's podcast on on foot drop. We talked about Easton. We went into mirror box. We looked at um, hand splints. We saw some shoulder exercise tools, hand grippers. That's not all. This is just scratching the surface, but we want to do a quick overview on some basics with Amazon. My recommendation, and then I want to hear from Pete, is read the reviews. Because a lot of times the reviews are great, but they don't have your condition. You know, one patient can say, oh, this was perfect for me. And that perfect person could have had a uh, hip replacement gone wrong and doesn't have spasticity, but just has foot drop. So you got to make sure you're matching up the, uh, the the review with what your condition is for whatever the, the purpose. My second tip, if you can't read the description very easily and they keep repeating things and it's trying to lump in all these diagnoses, I wouldn't go with that. Uh, product. Um, and, and then uh, the, the final one is, is it backed by research? We know everyone has a budget and you don't have to buy everything at once. Try to buy one or two things every two or three months, but put them in order of, of efficacy. And if you're not sure what's the best order, you can email me and contact me and I can kind of give you some recommendations. So I'll, I'll close with that and hear from Pete. Uh, all great points. And, and I think people probably really appreciated the walkthrough. The last thing I'll leave you with, it, it's it's like anything. A lot of times you get what you pay for, right? So Amazon is, is you know, very often pushing the cheaper product to the top. Um, and, and, you know, if you buy on cost, sometimes, sometimes you can find a product that is really affordable and does a great job. But if you're talking about returning yourself to active daily living, trying to get reduced pain, uh, re- improve stability, and just get yourself back to normal. Uh, as we all know, the struggle is real, right? It, it takes thousands of reps. You're going to be using this equipment for a long period of time, and it's going to become it's going to become very familiar to you. So you want something that's comfortable, something that's working, because you don't want to spend hours and hours trying these products and find that it doesn't work. So um, in addition to checking the reviews, if you can find any video content uh, on Amazon or on YouTube around those products, definitely check those things out as well. And then, as Henry said, ask your, uh, ask, ask your healthcare professional, ask your therapist. Um, what have you seen that works? And, and try to get their device um, recommendations. That's right. And I would say my final, my final uh, two points is you can, when you look for research, because uh, I, I brought up research, definitely check out the ebrsr.com. You can also um, look at PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. And you can type in specifically, let's say, mirror therapy and stroke, and you'll see all the research come up. So always verify uh, before purchasing, um, and that will that will help go a long way. And finally, uh, if you're out there and you're lost and you don't really have the support and you're really scratching your head and you didn't have a good therapy experience, you can always count on those one or two or three uh, companies that specialize in stroke because I'm sure their content's going to be great. And that's what Pete mm-hmm. was mentioning before. So there's a, there's hope. Don't give up. It's a long journey. And here's the best news. There's no expiration date on neuroplasticity. So whether you're uh, three months post-stroke or 30 years post-stroke, our brains rewire negatively or positively. I can have a traumatic event happen to me tonight, and I'm going to have a negative neuroplasticity. I'm going to have PTSD, or I'm going to have depression. And positively, your brain can rewire 30 years post-stroke as well. So don't give up. Our tagline's no plateau in sight. And it was fun shopping with you today. That's right. Henry, thanks so much for the uh, shopping listen. That's our latest edition of the No Plateau podcast. Tune in next time. We'll, we'll draw in, drill down into some more products and some more uh, pitfalls of shopping for these types of products. 
uh, in a future episode. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to the No Plateau podcast. Please make sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on more stroke and brain injury recovery stories. The No Plateau podcast is intended to give you an insight into stroke and brain injury survivors' journeys. Any opinions given on this podcast are strictly the individuals, and we do not suggest that you necessarily hold the same viewpoints as anyone on this podcast. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Reliance on any information provided by the No Plateau podcast is solely at your own risk.